Well, hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Connections. Today I'm very thrilled to be speaking with one part of the global phenomena, the piano guys. So we have John Smith. Uh, very nice to have you, John. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. And uh, I know right now it's kind of a busy time. We have holidays and all that kind of stuff. Is this kind of like a down period for you? One of the times you can just be with family or are you very busy with projects at the moment? Yeah, we, we don't tour in the summer. So okay. we have a summer, you know, and it's nice. That's really great. Yeah, it's great. Get that time with the kids. Yeah. Um, so Steve has, Steve has young kids still, you know, mine are, I'm, we're kind of, we just had our, our uh, we kind of became empty nesters this year. So oh, okay. <laughs> oh, it's kind of nice. So is it true? I heard that um, your, maybe your mother or your father was an opera singer. Is that true when you were little? Yeah, my dad was an operatic tenor. Oh, very cool. So you grew up yeah. really listening, getting that strong ear experience. Yeah, my, you know, my sister, I was the youngest in the family and my oldest sister was a piano performance major. She was amazing. She's the best pianist in the family. Oh, really? And I grew up listening to her accompanying him on German art songs and, and they would do performances. And uh, it, was, it was a great, great musical heritage. So yeah, and very musical family. So then was the piano like something like a happy accident? Did you want to do it maybe because your older sister was doing it? How did that come about that you started studying piano? Yeah, as the fifth child in a very musical family, I just saw all my brothers and sisters, you know, taking music lessons. And I just fell into it. It was just sort of an expectation. I guess it would have been weird if, if it didn't happen. <laughs> did you have like band where you tried out other things um, or not really? No, I just, I kind of stuck with piano. I, I think I tried guitar for five minutes and it hurt my fingers so badly. Oh, yeah. So I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm down to that was an <laughs> build, up these, no. <laughs> build up these calluses. <laughs> I didn't have, I didn't have a, a mom forcing me to, to do it. So I guess, you know, hats off to my mom. <laughs> Yeah, that's really important, I think, for the parents to kind of let you decide and, and find your own rhythm with what you're going to do. Yeah, absolutely. So then was it mainly you were training with family at home or did you go like into a school to train? It, you know, my sister was she was really pro. I mean, she uh, like I say, she was studying at the university yeah. in the piano performance major and she was 11 years older than me. And she just I don't know if she ever got paid, but. <laughs> she just gave me weekly lessons and did did kind of the classical regimen that she had she had received and it all kind of went to her you know oh, that's <laughs> and then awesome. she and then she shared it with me and um she was she was amazing and everybody thought of her as the family pianist but uh yeah when i was when i was in junior high i started to listen to billy joel mm -hmm. and um was really inspired by him and then there was this group called Mannheim Steamroller that was putting out original music uh they're well known for their Christmas music but they uh in the early days did original music and I was really captivated as a 13 year old as I listened to their first album uh because they they just blatantly brought together these two worlds that I was mm. that I that I had which was classical I had the old world and then I was kind of a child of the 80s with all of that, you know, um, really creative keyboard stuff that was that was hitting the scene. Um, so Mannheim Steamroller kind of blatantly mixed old and new. And it just intrigued me. I thought it was so cool. And I think it really influenced the original music that I started to write as a teenager and into my twenties. And I kind of, that's what, that's that kind of how I got established is with, with my original music for about 25 years, I put out eight albums of original tunes before the piano guys, so. Wow, that's really cool. So then when you, did you consider going to the way your sister did to go to university for music? Or I've heard maybe you, you did like a realtor degree or something like that differently? Steve did a realtor degree and um, I, I was going to get an MBA. I was going to, uh, uh, I didn't want to be a musician. I actually, <laughs> okay. my sister, um, 
for some strange reason wanted me to try out for a music scholarship when I was 16. And I went up and auditioned just, just for her. I played a Chopin military polonaise and I won the scholarship and oh, wow. I didn't end up doing anything with it because I didn't want to be a musician that badly. <laughs> and I, I just, I'd always heard these horror stories of, you know, how hard it is on your family. So I, I, I wanted nothing to do with it. I, I just kind of wanted to do it on the side. So. <laughs> so you were financing nine albums on the side while you were just working. Yeah. Well, actually when I, when, when, when my wife and I got married, we, we uh, kind of made a decision together, um, you know, try to figure out what, what we wanted to do for a living. And I was, I had been doing music on the side and putting out recordings for fun and playing benefit concerts. And um, I had already sold like several thousand albums or C or they were cassette tapes. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we thought, well, let's, let's just give music a try for a year. And took a risk and I never I never went to grad school and got that MBA I had you know I graduated in English and then I was going to get that MBA and it just never happened every year after year we just were like well let's try it another year <laughs> but it was a decision that I made with her which mm -hmm. I feel like that's that's what allowed me to do it I just it's something I never felt like I could impose yeah. upon this poor person that decided to marry me so <laughs> Once we were married, that's that's when it kind of became an option. Okay, understood. And your wife is musical as well. Yeah, she. Yeah, definitely. I mean, she's hasn't really, you know, put a lot of time into perfecting an instrument, but she's got incredible musical instincts. And um, I counsel with her. She's my best person to counsel with. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to have someone in the home that can give you that feedback right away. Oh, for sure. Yeah, and, and sometimes she just has money input. So <laughs> it's really, really great. So when was the first time that you met and played with Stephen Sharp Nelson? I was um, I was doing a show with several artists and he was playing as a cellist for one of the artists, um, just this high school kid. I'm like, hey, you wouldn't mind sitting in on one of, on my set on this tune. And he was the kind of kid that you could just, he didn't need sheet music. You could just, he could improvise. He was a, imp, a cellist that could improvise. He, you know, and, and as I, you know, I had worked with like concert, you know, symphony players in, in the sessions that I had done. And they always needed every last thing spelled out with, mm. with sheet music. And it was just so cool to just be able to explain to him, you know, I mean, just make something up along with this. And he was just a genius and uh, he was able to just sit in on the tune. And, and so I just started using him in my set uh, or in, in my, in my uh, solo shows and started off with him doing one or two numbers. And um, after a few years, I decided, I, I realized what an incredibly funny guy he was. <laughs> I thought, what if we put a, what if we put a microphone? What if we, you know, put a, a vocal mic in front of him and just banter back and forth during the show. And it was such a hit. Like it was such a hit. Like everybody thought it was you know, like my audience. I had, I had gained like a regional, um, I became, I had become a regional act by then. And like the audiences just went nuts. They just thought it, that it was such a great addition because it just brought this like Smothers Brothers vibe where, uh, you know, we could highlight what, I think is world-class comedic, comedic talent and timing that Steve has. I mean, he, he actually could host a talk show or something like that. He's that quick-minded. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's really a cool aspect of the show. So it sounds like that connection was instantaneous. Was it also very early on that you decided to mix these worlds? Like you were saying before, as a kid, you got inspired. So the classical and popular and different kinds of genres, was it that early on in your partnership that it began? Yeah, also, you know, and it was interesting because Steve had a real classical background growing up as well. And um, so it was, it's really incredible how we both had this, um, tendency musical tendency to mix the old and the new mm -hmm. and um 
we we saw eye to eye on that. It was it it, it was a real uncanny unity that that we felt when we started when we eventually started writing together. You know, we I would pull him right into the studio. I think the first real hit that we produced together was on a, a early album of mine pre Piano Guys. So we we took Paco Bell's Canon and we combined it with U two, and it was called Paco Bell meets U two and you know, we just, we, we tried to literally mix an old song with a new song. And it was so well received as we did it in our shows. They were like, wow, this is, this is cool to mash up old or, you know, two different things it seemed to be very intriguing to people musically. Um, and I, I think it's, I think it's a cool concept just in general to, to do a mashup type concept i think it's it, it really it really makes people intrigued so it was your first video um that kind of made it a, a hit online was that the love story meets viva la vida yeah yeah and then um it was it was about 12 years ago that we decided you know we, we we'd heard about people putting videos on youtube and that they would go viral and it was back in the days when some people would say well what is youtube you, you know yeah but we put out we put out this this mashup of love story by taylor swift which was my kids favorite tune on the radio <laughs> i was just trying to do something that they would think was cool you know the insecure dad always trying to get their kids to think they're cool and then we combined it with a, another tune that our kids liked uh, that and you know obviously we like these, these tunes too and that was Viva La Vida by Coldplay but it started out with me trying to arrange love story in a real epic way um, to match the words that that in a way that, that my kids described why they liked the tune I had that in mind as I was arranging it and then it got so big that it didn't feel like it, it could end. And I'm like, what do we do now? And just had this crazy idea to have it go into Coldplay. And, and I thought, people will think this is weird, but <laughs> we, we recorded it and people loved it. And then we were like, you know, let's make a video. Let's make, and, and Steve had helped on the recording. And then we decided to just get a guy that we knew that that knew how to film and we put it on YouTube and it went crazy. It like within a, a month's time, it had over a million views and we were so excited. We were getting emails from all over the world. Like somebody wanted to come, come do a concert in, in um, gosh, where was it? Malaysia. Oh, wow. They, they thought we were big, big, a big act. And they're like, come <laughs> be in our, concert series in Malaysia and it's really it was it was amazing it was it was an amazing experience but that's kind of what what started the piano guys and I know it's been talked about before you the kind of joke you know the piano guys you got a pianist but there's also a cellist I'm oh, very no it's horrible <laughs> it's horrible because we we have I have this buddy he owned a piano store called the piano guys and he he had asked me to you know help him uh market his pianos but he's like i want to put pianos like in in the middle of the canyon down here in southern utah middle of the red rocks could you come play one of your compositions and i had done several of these for, as a favor for him and after you know i had done that a few few of those he's like let's let's get steve involved and let's let's go all out and and let's see what happens you know and so we put all our eggs in a basket. I had a mailing list of 30,000 people and we we're like, everybody watch this and see what happens. And it exceeded our expectations by, you know, but we were thinking, you know, we could always change our name. And then we looked into changing our name and we found out that we would have, we would lose millions of hits on mm. this channel if we were to, if we were to, um, sorry about that. <laughs> You're fine. We would, so we were like, we can't lose millions of hits. We can't lose all of this momentum. So we just had to stick with Paul's, uh, the name of his YouTube channel, which was the Piano Guys. So poor Steve <laughs> has to be known as a piano guy for the rest of his life. And I look like the biggest jerk on the planet. <laughs> so 
it's uh it's really a cra it's it's a name that we're we're not thrilled about but oh well but it's stuck we, and we didn't think it would go but we didn't think it would go big we didn't think we would be performing in all of these you know like in royal albert hall and sydney opera house and all that we didn't we, we were just kind of helping paul out you know and then it just it just took off and here we are with this weird awkward name going oh <laughs> oh well <laughs> do you remember any of the other names that you were thinking about uh yeah we just we wanted anything but the piano guys <laughs> okay. you know? and then we looked into changing the you know looked into youtube as far as changing the channel name and it, it's just like there's no way to do that without losing all of your all of your hits and by then we had built up like millions of hits yeah so just go with it so yeah. i have a question for you as you know classical crossover magazine we are very happy to claim you guys as classical crossover artists but i'm curious if you feel the same Thank way you. or if you feel like you know maybe even classical crossover doesn't contain all of what you're doing as a genre like is it wider than that um we yeah that that designation classical crossover i think it, it fits us the best um i wish when you went to i uh, you know apple music and it says what genre of music do you like i wish classical crossover would come up yes. maybe if you have connections you could <laughs> arrange for that to do because yeah. I, I do think that we would fall into like the top 10 in that and that would be awesome i, I think that's where we fit so Oh, that's well, that's good for me to hear. But yeah, I agree. I feel like some places like Australia, they do have a separate crossover chart, but it just hasn't made that way to the US yet. So yeah. Um, uh, well, tell us. Great. Yeah, I mean, that's our goal with Classical Crossover Magazine. We really want to show that this is a genre um, and all Absolutely. the amazing artists. Um, so I'm curious, you know, you've you mentioned putting a piano on a, a mountain. Um, have you ever been like scared of heights or anything when you're doing these things or are you just a good sport you're ready to go for it the, the thing that always comes to mind is stephen wright's joke where he says he's scared of widths okay <laughs> sorry <laughs> luckily i'm not afraid of heights but one time steve was sitting within inches of the cliff edge and the 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 uh, camera operator flew by in the helicopter and, and the, the wind from the rotors kind of lifted his chair and that was probably the scariest moment oh wow for for one of our video shoots because he, he thought he was going to go over the side <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah that sounds pretty scary and then you guys also had a pretty epic one where you took uh a piano up on the great wall of china yeah insane yeah and we got uh it was a local uh, municipality area of the great wall we didn't have to deal with the national government and we, we were able to deal with the local government and and uh, find sort of a remote spot of the of the great wall but uh yeah and we we put it on with a crane and then 30 guys carried it about a football field length up the, up the, wow. <laughs> up the wall until until we found until they were in the spot where where we needed to be so well, these special Crazy. videos, yeah, I mean, they are something to view and then also something to listen to. And I think you've said before that you always want to make sure that the great scenery doesn't distract from the music. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, and, and I, I would say that um, there's only uh, a small percentage of our catalog that, well, maybe it's about half. Half of our catalogs have videos. But if you tell your phone to play piano, guys, you'll hear lots of music that doesn't have a video you know never had a video um lots of original music we like to do um you know our take of old tunes like moonlight sonata or you know the pathetique or you know bach or <clears throat> whatever or, or we we like to put an old spin on on new music you know like justin bieber or you know you make it sound like something that's classical um, we like to do film music um, because that's by definition a, a blend it's crossover in my opinion film music is is a great example of crossover music yeah so. and, and then we like to do goofy stuff every once in a while <laughs> so. 
Well, that's important too, because you've said you don't take yourself too seriously. I feel like that's the opposite. When you go to school, you have to really take yourself seriously, but that's what people enjoy about you guys is you can just feel it. Yeah, I think that's one thing that maybe made me not get that piano performance scholarship is because I felt like it was, um, you know, I, I didn't want to, I didn't, I, I wanted to keep things fun. I wanted mm -hmm. to keep my music fun. And um, I had heard that, that a lot of times people would get so intense that it, they lost the joy. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I hope that's not always the case, but, but with the people that I was talking to, that was the impression that I was getting. And, and so, um, but you know, a real, a real inspiration for me growing up, my older brother would always play PDQ Bach for me. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with I'm Peter not, no. and PDQ Bach, but um, he, he would bring, he, he would bring comedy into classical music in a way that nobody else in history could you you got to youtube pdq bach okay <laughs> uh, and and you'll you'll hear you know one of my favorites that comes up is he does a, a thing called eine kleine nichtmusik which is a take it, it's a take it's a variation of eine kleine nachtmusik nacht means night nicht means not so it's like <laughs> a little not music is <laughs> his his title and and it's just a brilliant performance of Ina Klein and Nach music and then he throws in snippets of the most unexpected um, you know quotes from <laughs> everything from shave and a haircut to <laughs> I mean it's just it's hilarious how he fits in all of these little like 20 different things that he bombs that he drops in or you're like that does not belong in classical music and it's just hilarious so you have to you have to look that up but he was a real inspiration he put out like he put out like 20 albums wow. and he would do live she came to salt lake city and did a live show and um just the epitome of a classical music scene that doesn't take itself seriously and we definitely have that vibe in the piano guys show you know, that he's totally inspired us to not take ourselves seriously I will check that out. And I'm curious, are there other artists that you, you listen to on a regular basis that really inspire you as well? Uh, yeah, I really love choral music. I would, I would mm. have to say that's, that's my, I just, I love that genre. You know, John Rutter and um, Eric Whitaker, um, it's just, just great, great stuff. That would be a pretty epic collaboration yourselves. And, and I would love to collaborate. Yeah. <laughs> With them, yeah, we're we're doing a collaboration with the uh, with the uh, uh, Tabernacle. Uh, what do they call themselves oh. now? The Tabernacle Choir on Temple Square um, this month with Mac Wilberg, who writes amazing choral music as well. Oh, that's going to be amazing! I grew up listening to them. My mom would buy the CDs. What an incredible choir they are! Yeah. So, another thing with your music that you say kind of anchors you is your faith, right? So share us a little bit about that, because I think you can get lost in this thing in the music business. It's quite rough on people. Um, so you need you do need something, whether that's faith or something else to really keep you um, sane. <laughs> yeah, it's been very, very helpful. I mean, even just right from the start, with, you know, my wife and I trying to figure out if we should do music, you know, it's just it just felt like something that that we should we should pray over. And um, I think that we got a real push, a real uh, definite push, do it. And it overcame a lot of misgivings that we had. And uh, I, read a, I read a book about a, a great painter. Her name's Minerva Teichert. Mm -hmm. And she's done some great, great, great art. She was recognized uh, as one of the you know, premier artists in, in her time. And she's like, I never picked up a paintbrush without praying first. I'm like, wow, that is really cool. I, why don't I do that? You know, and so I, I started to, and she says whenever she came into a, came encountered a problem in her writing, she would, she would pray for a solution. And I, and I think of 
The Hiding Place, that great classic book, The Hiding Place, where he was a watchmaker. And every time he had a problem with his watchmaking, he would go into the back and he would pray and he would always find a way to, you know, solve the problem. And pretty soon people were coming from the neighborhood with their problems and asking him to pray over them. And uh, it was just a real inspiration. I was like, I should be doing this in my life, you know, and it's it's been it's been awesome. We do it. We do it with the piano guys um, when we when we encounter problems. And and I honestly feel like some of the solutions have been awesome. Just where it's like, yeah, that wasn't us. So it's it's been a it's been something we rely on. A real asset. Yeah, that, that's beautiful. The story you mentioned about the painter um, and just to see God's hand and everything. That's really incredible. Um, so I'm curious, you know, for some young kids that are seeing you guys, they're so inspired by what you do. Um, do you have any like lessons learned or suggestions that you would give to someone that's starting out? You know, one thing I always say is um, if you want to get good at anything, um, you kind of have to, <clears throat> I think of my kids and when they would get a new video game that they had wanted for a long time and they would they would just put so much time into it they would just mm -hmm. like they would want to spend like hours um and they would get that's how they would get good at whatever the video game was and pretty soon it would all become second nature you know and and i always think you kind of have to put that sort of time that video game level time into whatever you want to get good at whether it be mm -hmm foul shooting or getting your muscle memory for pitching you know baseball pitching or dance or, or whatever it is you can't you just kind of can't the expectation to get there in 20 minutes a day or half hour a day it's just unrealistic you know you, you think of those figure skaters and you think of how much time they put into a two-minute routine it's just it's staggering to think how much time they, they put into that to make it all into their muscle memory. And I think that's, that's the biggest advice that I would give if you want to master something or get good at something is your expectation for the amount of time to put in needs to be similar to like, what do you, how much time do you put into a video game? You know, that's, that's what it takes. And you've created your own piano method, is that right? Yeah, for beginner, for beginner note reading. Yeah, so. so share a little bit, because I know I have a couple littles that I teach and we mainly do like the Faber or the Alfred, but I'm, I'm really curious to hear about your method. Yeah, if you, if you uh, are using every good boy does fine to teach the notes, which is the old, yes. the old <laughs> way, this is a method that um, cuts down the steps from, you know, cognitive steps from you know three or four or five cognitive steps before you see the note and push the right key it cuts it down to like one or two steps and it's in a book called 67 fun songs it's available on the piano guys.com but i do i do think that there's better stuff out there now <laughs> i do i think it was it was great i think it serves a purpose especially for beginners um but i'll bet I'll bet there. I mean, there's there's such interactive stuff out there, and I think I think there's stuff that's similar, but it it, it updates with current music. I kind of have done it with you know folk tunes and stuff, but but I think I don't know. It's, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great sales pitch. <laughs> It's definitely fine. Okay. I'm just glad I don't have to worry about the sell, the, how it sells anymore, you know, because I, I just, it's, I think, you know, it's 10 years old now. And so. Okay. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about, you mentioned you take the summers off and it seems like you really prioritize your family. So how does that go? Because you guys have, I think it's like over a billion, maybe a billion and a half views now you know you've obviously played at these incredible places um how do you kind of balance that success and also the privacy that you need um you know what it's it, it, <laughs> i tell people i feel about as famous as the guy that plays on the professional basketball team that sits bench 
it's about how famous is famous I feel it's it's nice we we go out in public and feel you know I think more people know the name piano guys than recognize it. a lot of times we'll be talking to people and you know and then and then the name piano guys will come up and they'll like yeah I know the piano guys I'm like you do cool you know so I, I don't know if people recognize the face as much so it, it hasn't been bad. I mean, it hasn't been too, uh, uh, it hasn't been too horrible. So when you go to tour, let's say you're coming up um, in September, you're gonna perform at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. So you can go when you're not on stage, you can go like to a cafe and you won't get any people. Yeah, it's not, it's not oh, horrible. It's great. It, you know, it's, if, if we're in this region, you know, cause we're from Utah and you know, if, if we're in Utah, Idaho, Arizona, Nevada, it, it we we definitely get recognized a lot more like in my home state definitely but um outside of that area we feel pretty pretty not normal pretty incognito i like i say we'll probably run into people that that have heard of the piano guys but um i mean it's 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 like you know it's i think it, it's a good 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 um you know, you, you have a lot of like professional baseball players that they, they feel totally normal, but then yeah. it kind of goes this range, you know, some of them just don't, you know, and we're just luckily still in that range of, you know, most people don't recognize our face when they see us. But that's, I don't know, to me, that's kind of the ideal thing. That's one thing I've always admired from Celtic women. It seems like they can perform at the big venues and then just be people. So yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Especially great for our kids. Because <laughs> they don't have to be. <laughs> In a fishbowl with people watching yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> Well, tell us, so you're, you mentioned constantly putting out new music, right? So you have had your album 10, you have your latest single is As It Was. And then I think I, I saw that you did also an EP of classical songs, Symphony Classical. Um, so tell us about a couple of the ones you've just done and then some things that are coming up because I know you guys are just constantly making music. Yeah, we, um, we, we kind of went on a binge last year and um, we, we did a lullaby album and then we were, we like had so many ideas for it that we actually made two albums. Um, one is called Chill, and one is called Lullaby. And I just love. It. I I kind of headed up the Lullaby album, and I just I just felt so much, so much inspiration. Just like it was just overflowing. I loved um, a Lullaby arrangement that that we came up with. Uh, Every breath you take. I just imagine, you know, just that that magic when you when you're just watching your baby sleeping, and um, you know you can hear little crickets in there. But it, in my opinion, is such a cool arrangement of every breath you take. So you, everybody, tell your phone to play piano guys. Every breath you take, you will not regret. I I just think it's so it's so beautiful, but it's also kind of romantic. I think it could be we're a lot of people use our music in weddings in the wedding market. It's it's huge. Like, I did. <laughs> uh, a thousand years, I think, is just one that we get we get feedback all the time that people walk down the aisle to our arrangement of a thousand years by Christina Perry. Um, but but a lot of those tunes on that lullaby album could be like we did it, we did a an uh a arrangement of you'll be in my heart. Mm -hmm. But I just see it's just magic. Uh, we, we also, I, I was challenged by Paul, who's the owner of the piano store. He's like, see if you can take like something that nobody would ever think was a lullaby, could ever be a lullaby and lullaby fire, it. <laughs> lullaby a fire. It. So we took um, Eye of the Tiger. <laughs> oh, okay. And we turned it into a lullaby and it's, it made my wife cry. It is that pretty. I was really, really happy with with how that. So, take tell your phone, play "Eye of the Tiger" by the Piano Guys, and you will hear a really pretty lullaby. And we combined it with the, all the pretty little horses because Ooh. melodically the two songs are very similar. the 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 melody of "All the Pretty Horses" and "Eye of the Tiger," if you play them at the same tempo have very similar melodies. 
So it's crazy how sometimes you don't put it together, but then once you do, you're just like, yeah, this is a perfect <laughs> match. Yeah, it, it turned out really awesome. <laughs> well, like you're saying, just go to Spotify, say play piano guys, because or just tell your phone, play. just yeah. like you literally just tell your phone, play this song by the piano guys. And all of a sudden it starts playing. It's a really cool age. I really think if Krispy Kreme Donuts could do that, talk to your phone, give me a Krispy Kreme donut. <laughs> they would be so psyched and they would tell everybody to use it. But, but that is some, such a cool thing about this digital age. Yeah. It's so easy to get to the music you want. Yeah, no, I have to say, you mentioned weddings, and I played your uh, Mella Fantasia, How Great Thou Art, I think when the mothers came. Oh, in, cool. So. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. It was very cool. Yeah, and the, 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 the title we gave that is The Mission, How Great Thou Art. So people could tell their phone, play piano, guys, The Mission, How Great Thou Art. That's a, we were so thrilled. That's one of those tunes where we were running into problems all the time trying to combine those songs. And we literally just kept praying just kept getting cool solutions. One of the solutions was just, just bump that song, just bump it over one beat and it's, and it's gonna work in that spot, you know? And we never would have thought of it, but yeah. Just got anyway. inspired in that moment. That's yeah. incredible. Well, thank you. Cause again, <laughs> it was a special part of my day. So it's such a privilege to chat with you. Um, well, thank you. I am curious, so this show you have coming up, do you have other shows in New York before as well, or is it you're going straight to New Jersey and then on to other places? Uh, we're just doing a New Jersey on this on this swing. We just go wherever our booking agent tells us. Okay. And we're very <laughs> thankful. We're very blessed to have one of the best booking agents in the world. So yeah, Andrea Johnson, she, she is amazing. So if people haven't seen your show before, you said it come for a mix of comedy and it's also, it's family friendly, right? So everyone can yeah, just come. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, uh, we're dads and we, uh, we, we're dialed into what, what, what all the ages, you know, but I mean, it, we, we throw it. The thing that I love is we get this feedback all the time is that we, you know, we were there with, the whole age range with our family and everyone loved it. And that is the coolest thing to hear. Um, you and know, we're thing to find, <laughs> and we, you know, sometimes we'll play upside down with the hands crossed and Steve has his loop pedals and his effects boxes. And his, he, he does even has a, 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 what, a talk box. He, he rigged a talk box. Um, he, the things that he does, like he'll play his cello like a percussion instrument. He plays with a kick drum. Like you've never seen a cellist like this. The way he is, the way he is, like evolved over the years, and and he's just brilliant. He's you know he was also a drummer, so um, yeah, it's it's cello like you've never seen before. It really should be called the cello guys. It's <laughs> it's really such an injustice. Such a justice. <laughs> well, I love that. Thank you so much for chatting with me today, John. And I'm just curious, as you think you've, you know, you've accomplished so much, are there still things that you want to do either musically or maybe teaching anything else um, in the music business? Gosh, I just, I'm having so much fun. We just uh, barely um, had uh, a studio installed in the home, in my home. Oh, nice. And I am just in heaven being able to use the studio as a writing tool, you know, not worrying about um, hassling everybody like, gosh, I want to try this. I want to try that. I want to, and, and how much money that costs and, yeah. and everybody getting impatient with me because I love trying every last option <laughs> and then picking the best one. That's what I love, you know, and now I can do it. And it's just, I'm just so excited. I feel like it's a renaissance for me musically. And I'm just, I'm just having so much fun. And I think that's why the Lullaby album was so fun for me is because it was my first break in of this studio where, you know, I can try stuff and then I can hear it with the reverb and I can hear how it's gonna sound in the final product. Whereas to try to imagine that on an acoustic piano is so difficult, you know, while you're playing trying to imagine the experience of somebody listening and to be able to do that, to be able to have that, I am just psyched. 
it's such an inspiration. It just feels like a, a renaissance as far, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm starting over and I'm just so excited to see what, what comes out of that, so. That's amazing. Yeah, I love what technology has done in order to just give us new chances to be creative. So that's amazing. We're excited to hear your next releases then. Um, and then it's Wednesday, September 14th that you'll be at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. So thank you again so much, John. What a treat to thank chat you. with you. Great. Thanks for thanks for having us. For, for me, having me. <laughs> us. Yeah, come back anytime you have a new release. Love to chat with you again. <laughs> Thank you. Have a have a great one and hope to see you at the show. Thank you. Yes, I hope to be there. Have a blessed one as well. Okay.